And I wanted to announce also that uh, the nonviolence intersects with this big industry called conflict resolution. The way I look at it, conflict resolution is the first third of our escalation curve. Then we come in on the second and third. You know, we're sort of like the Marines. <laughs> uh, and but there are some excellent projects going on uh, in dispute resolution, which are not just aimed at domestic or social, but even at international dispute resolution. And of those outfits, the best that I know of is called the Search for Common Ground, which is based in Washington, D.C. It was started by John Marx, who actually uh, was in the government before he wised up. He may even have been in the CIA. I'm not sure. You sort of assume people are in the CIA if they don't tell you that they were in the CIA. And uh, it's just grown by leaps and bounds, and it's terrific because it, it deals with the most intractable conflicts. They spent several years in Jerusalem <coughs> dealing with uh, you know, Arab, Arab Israeli things. And they also domestically, they have done common ground workshops on abortion, which are very, very difficult. And the way they work is they start off by saying, okay, what do we have in common, uh, however small it may be, and let's build out from there. And they're just very, very good at it. They've started a uh, a soap opera in several countries, like the sub-Saharan countries. So they're dealing with this at the cultural level as well. And they're going to be in town on March 3rd in the evening in Oakland. By the way, if anyone goes out that door, <laughs> be very careful. It's a, not a nonviolent door. Uh, they're going to be in Oakland on March 3rd at Preservation Park. Don't know where that is, but it sounds like a good – place to do it. And if you want further information, this is the association – Alternative Dispute Resolution something something dot net. Um, John Marks will be there as the keynote speaker, and it's very unusual he gets out to this area. Um, okay, I guess we have a victory on our hands. I gather that the Oak Satyagraha was successful. That's what I'm seeing. Yep. Uh, it's typical in that it was victorious. Uh, it was also typical in that it, it was an ecological struggle. We're going to talk about quite a few of those when we get to that section of the course. And in most cases, it will be people fighting for their very lives when their livelihood is being snatched out from under them. Here, it was just some super alert Berkeley students who recognized the value of an oak tree. I remember we had a chancellor on this campus once who, when we were preparing to cut down faculty glade, uh, we gave him a lot of trouble and finally he said, don't worry, I have been fully sensitized like he was not sensitive. Well, fortunately, we didn't have to sacrifice the faculty to save the glade. But if we had made that move, we would have been stage three. And it's also typical um, – what? No, I guess that was what I wanted to say about that. Um, so we are now going to s launch into our topic of insurrectionary movements, which uh, I define as movements which attempt to overthrow an established regime uh, that they are in. And uh, we saw this sputtering at the beginning of this in the 1940s in Central America. <coughs> and then it's going to go on sputtering here and there. There'll be a rather dramatic episode in Pakistan, which was never reported, which didn't get any international uh, attention <coughs> and therefore – partly therefore didn't succeed very well. But then there's an explosion of movements in the 80s, some of them connected with the sudden vacuum of power uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, but the Philippines was different. So we're going to look at a film now. Uh, in a couple of minutes, which is – first of all, it was sponsored by the Mary Knoll Mo uh, Order, which is important because it shows you one of the many connections that we're going to be seeing between religious – established religious entities and nonviolent insurrections, nonviolent movements of one kind or another. And in Central America, South America, this has been particularly important.
And it's also a film that was made by an Israeli by the name of Ilan Ziv, who was a member of the Israeli Defense Force. So again, it gives us an example of a soldier who saw combat uh, directly, was affected by that, turned around and is now trying to do something about it. But before we quite start the film, I wanted to uh, go back to the good war and those who refused to fight it because we did stop it before the end. And I forgot there's actually some very important things happening at the end, which are timely right now, where they talked about what the, all those people did after their CO experiences. Um, it's interesting that Bill Sutherland said, and I think you heard him say this, that you don't demand success right now in my lifetime. You, as he put it, it's not true that you must have success in my country in my lifetime. You plan something and you pursue it and you take one step at a time. So this is uh, – partly this is our famous work versus work issue. You know, you don't necessarily have to see the thing succeed, quote unquote, right there in front of you. But the fact is that when you do something nonviolent, it will have good results. Even staunching the flow of coffee lattes in uh, classrooms is bound to have a good result for the people downstairs. Uh, now George Hauser, whom you saw in the film, he and James Farmer started the Congress of, Ra of Racial Equality, CORE, which is a very important institution, organization, because it helped to launch the Freedom Rides and it was a key part of the Civil Rights Movement. They actually founded CORE during World War II while they were going through the CO experience. George Hauser and, George and James Farmer did that. Bill Sutherland and George Hauser devoted their lives to nonviolence in Africa and African liberation struggles. And that's, that's an extremely interesting part of the world that I really wish we had more time to discuss. We, you will have a chapter on South Africa, which was this big success story, Union of South Africa, in the uh, Zunas, Kurtz, and Asher book that you – will be reading soon. But also there were two African leaders who tried to put their liberation struggles on a nonviolent track, Nyerere and Nkrumah. And they both met with indifferent success. Not that the nonviolence wasn't successful against the opposition. They were not too successful in getting people on board with it. Um, <coughs> so in between South Africa and the Sahara, the experiences have been rather mixed. Uh, and I really wish we had more time to talk about it. One thing is certain, and that is that that whole thing was launched by Gandhi because uh, African soldiers were part of the British Empire. They were drafted off their uh, Cadbury plantations and brought up to fight in India. And the Indians would say, why don't you win your own freedom first before you start winning it for the British? And they caught fire with this and, and went back and launched that whole thing. Not that they completely got it, how to do it nonviolently, but at least they got the liberation part. Okay, but if I don't stop talking pretty soon, we won't actually get onto this film. So this is a documentary on the overthrow of um, Pinochet in Chile, which was done by constitutional means after a popular movement. It's going to talk about the first intifada, which was the relatively nonviolent one. And I'll have a lot more to say about that and have a chapter on that. And the big, the big one, the famous one, is the People Power Revolution in the Philippines, which was completely successful. But I'm going to say it was completely successful but n did not totally work in our sense, work without quote marks. And I've revised a little bit my own version of what it takes to launch an insurrectionary movement that goes on and really changes things. Uh, you need – it has to be a just cause and you'll see how a lot of these movements began. The stumbling block for the dictatorship was where they uh, tried their hand at voter fraud. Apparently in some countries people do not put up with voter fraud. I don't know why. It's a perfectly normal thing. So it seems weird to me. <laughs> but <coughs> some countries they don't. Then as this film will emphasize, you need the courage. And I'm going to add the vision to see through the new clothes that the emperor is wearing. You have to see that this is an illegitimate domination. And you have to have the courage to stand up to it. And it's really pretty amazing 
how quickly it often falls down when you do that. But then, if you want the thing to launch into a permanent positive change, I think you need two other things. One that I've mentioned before, you need to have the attitude that the person isn't the problem, that you don't hate the dictator, you just want him to stop being a dictator. In any case, you're not going to obey him anymore. And if you really want it to develop into something permanent, you need our famous friend constructive program. So have that kind of schema in the back of your mind. The film has its own scheme. And let's do the same thing that we did last time, which is go through and pick out comments that people make. Special attention to you know, what mental states they're going through when this is happening and uh, what are the elements that they identify as important and what are the ones that we can maybe read between the lines. Okay, John, you're, you're on. Roll them or whatever you say. Everybody okay? <laughs> There's a lot to chew on in that film. I uh, guess maybe I'll start by telling you a little bit about one of the narrators, uh, Gene Sharp. He, uh, if you're not familiar with his name, he was an extremely important pioneer in uh, nonviolence, especially nonviolence education, and he started that center at Harvard. Center for the Study of Nonviolent Sanctions in Conflict and Defense and collected a lot of material and a lot of documentation which we would not have if he had not done that. Uh, so we, we owe him a great debt. Um, he has recently retired and I think the, uh, an institution called Nonviolence International in Washington, D.C. is taking his whole library and trying to take him on down there. Um, that having been said, there is a difference between the kind of nonviolence that uh, I'm trying to explore with you here, which is sometimes called principled nonviolence, and, and the kind that uh, professor, uh, it wasn't professor actually, what Gene Sharp was about, which is sometimes called strategic nonviolence. And that somewhat came out in the film. Catherine? Yeah, I know somebody was talking about uh, Right. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, Catherine and I'm sure all the other A students were just jumping out of their chair wanting to point this out because <laughs> we, we noticed this immediately. Uh, Gandhi, who fasted, a, ma did major public fasts with political uh, intent, probably about 12 times, and about 10 of them were successful. And if you look around in his works, you'll see scattered here and there, and they were actually collected in a little bit, a little booklet, that there are, there are special rules for this. You don't just, uh, let's say, you know, sitting there in the oak trees and on the second day you say, okay, if you're still not giving us what we want, we're going to fast unto death up here. Uh, it's a question partly of timing because uh, laying down your life is your ultimate weapon. It's not something to be done lightly. And that was a problem with what Gene Sharp was suggesting, that it be done en masse right at the beginning. Well, not at the beginning, but you know, way too early in the struggle. So why don't we just run through that quickly. What are the rules for doing this right? Because that will kind of show us that uh, there's a science and a strategy to all of this. So who'd like to start? Yeah. Right. You have to be the right person for the job. And that means what exactly? It means two things, actually. Go ahead. No? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You have to uh, – this is going to bring up the second point that he always made is that you can only – fast against a lover, not against someone who doesn't care basically whether you live or die because you'll simply be wasting 
the effort. But so you have to be the right person in the sense that you have the trust. So there's some kind of bond between you and the persons toward whom you're aiming the fast. But you also have to be the right person for the job in a deeper sense and that is in order for you to render up your life, you have to have it to, to give up. And most of us, our will to live is way, way under the surface and we have no access to it. And I had a friend, as a matter of fact, who was uh, uh, poisoned by Agent Orange in Vietnam and uh, contracted a brain tumor and he was, he was dying. And uh, he, his wife and daughter were there and he said, you know, unplug me from this machine. I'm going to give up my life. So they unplugged him and about six hours later he came bounding up and said, plug me back in. You know, you don't know how deep that, that will to live is. And in order to really do this, to really do a fast unto death in order to persuade an opponent, you have to really, really be in charge of that desire deep, deep in your consciousness to really make it work. Yeah, and there this, is, this is the best ideal of best. <laughs> Dying for a cause is never my favorite mechanism. Mike? Were all of them fasts? No. Some of them were – well, some of he did a lot of things that were just penitential fasts. They had no political significance, just something he felt he had to take on. He invented that in South Africa when some of the young people in the, uh, in the ashram misbehaved. Apparently, this is a universal phenomenon. Young people misbehave. Uh, and he said, well, we, he, he wanted to sort of punish them, but he felt that on principle punishment was not appropriate in an ashram. But he had to do something. So he took it on himself. By, he fasted for a certain period. It was very effective. But in terms of political fasts, no, not all of them were fasts unto death. Some of them were like there was a 21-day fast. Um, but some of them were, I'm going to – if you don't come around, I'm checking out. So, okay, we've talked about two of the five rules. Usually I can remember four of them on any given occasion. What else have we got? Yes. Yeah, what Joanna is getting at is uh, – my way of putting it is it has to be consistent with the whole movement. You can't be a terrorist and then find yourself imprisoned and say, I'm not going to eat in here and expect it to have the desired effect. And we talked about this very unfortunate episode with the Irish hunger strikers in Long Cash Prison where in fact Margaret Thatcher was the wrong audience. They were the wrong people. It was not – there were a couple of other things they violated. But the biggest one they violated was they'd been going around – bombing people and kneecapping them and then they decided they were going to fast. And it's inconsistent. The message in nonviolence always has to be very clear and consistent. This is part of Nagler's law. Okay, so that's three. Zoe? It has to be a doable demand. You can't fast for somebody to do something unrealistic. Like there were two people in this country who fasted to get um, Premier Khrushchev and President whoever we had president at that time, to end the arms race. You know, and that was a little unrealistic. You have like you know, 700 million people who wanted the arms race to go on. You had two guys starving themselves in Washington, D.C. That was unrealistic. Okay, one other thing. Amy, did you have your hand up? It has to be the last resort. Excellent. Okay, it shows you the collective mind is better than any individual. Yes, it has to be the last resort because it's your most powerful weapon. And this is a frequent error is to go to that right away because it's the most dramatic thing. You know about it and you're impatient. You want to have an effect and so you jump right into that. And partly that was what was wrong with Gene Sharp making that suggestion at that point. Um, yeah, Robbie? Uh, you know – you, we're talking about human beings and therefore all bets are off. <laughs> I mean everything is a little bit unpredictable always. There's always going to be that swerve of the atom as uh, Lucretius said to where you cannot totally predict what's going to happen. You can't predict it on the subatomic level or on the personal level. But for it to have this most reliable opportunity to work, 
these five principles have to be followed. Catherine? Yeah, I think what he was suggesting also would violate – so it's it – actually it violated everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's just totally wrong the whole – all the way down. Yeah, it wouldn't, they wouldn't exactly – they could be classified as lovers at that point. Although toward the end, after those four days in February, then he could, they could definitely have reached them. Well, I – despite the darkness, I managed to scribble down a whole page of notes here. You guys also think this over. There's a lot that we can pick up on in this film and we'll take off from here on Thursday. <laughs>